engineers have still are able to come in, you know, after <laughs> after we've already thought about like where are we going to widen the highway, and they just figure out how to do it. You know, they're not thinking about the community, they're not thinking about the environment and the emissions and the noise and all of those other things. There's sort of already an assumption that this project is important and it's needed. Um, and we don't think about those bigger impacts. So I think it is so important that that be part of our engineering education. We cannot have engineers that are not thinking about, are not aware of the bigger, wider impacts of, um, of what we're building and what we're designing. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is Jeannie Ward-Waller from the Sacramento area. We're gonna be talking about uh, her new position uh, with the Fearless organization, as well as uh, really her past in terms of how she came to do this work as being a traditionally trained uh, engineer, as well as a little bit of a dust up that happened uh, when she was working for Caltrans. <laughs> so let's get right to it with Jeannie. Jeannie, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you, John. Great to be here. So Jeannie, one of the things I love uh, to have my guests do is just kind of introduce themselves. So who is Jeannie? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I uh, am a lot of things, maybe best known for being a transportation advocate and uh, advocate for biking, walking, transit, all things kind of sustainability related, uh, as well as for uh, equity and making sure that our most um, disadvantaged communities are benefiting from the investments and the work that we're doing um, in, in transportation policy. Um, I'm also a runner, I'm a mom, I'm a, a dog mom, um, and uh, love to just do lots of things outdoors. So trail running is the way I spend most of my time outside, but uh, I also love to ski and bike and um, rock climb, do lots of things outdoors. So anything that gets me outside is is uh, is fun and, and helps helps clear my brain for more advocacy work. <laughs> oh my gosh, we've got so many things in common. We could we could spend hours talking. Um, well, okay, okay, cool. So, so a trail runner too and a skier. Yep. So fantastic. Yeah. Well, I I, uh, I I I grew up near you, uh, up in in the town of Lincoln. And when I was a youngster, I was on the Junior National Ski Patrol up at Boreal Ridge, the ski resort up there, Amazing. right off of I eighty. Uh -huh. And cool. now I'm I'm a passionate trail runner. So that's one of the things that I love to do. Um, I just started awesome. dipping my toes into the world of ultra trail running and and trying to push the distances up there. So I haven't gone very far yet. I've, I've made it to the, uh, um, I, I guess, the 50 kilometer mark. So I've made it to 31 miles at this point. But yeah. Very cool. Well, be, beware because you get addicted. You know, the longer you go, the more you want to push up to, you know, that <laughs> oh, mile mark. So <laughs> believe me, I know I, I, uh, I was an Ironman distance triathlete for 20 years. So I, 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 I get the, the addiction to the, the longer distances. Yep, and, I did uh, triathlon too. So I can, I can, I'm a recovering triathlete. <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you end up landing in Sacramento of all places? Well, um, it's a good story, a, a long story, but I'll try to kind of give you the short version. So I started my career as an engineer uh, and I worked in Boston. I went to graduate school in Boston and I got a job in Cambridge across the river. Worked in the private sector for a small firm um, and was doing really interesting work. I was designing buildings, mostly large scale, um, you know, high rises, uh, university buildings, institutional buildings. Um, it was super interesting work, but I would say like, the day to day, you know, I loved seeing my work go up and like getting, you know, doing doing the real interesting parts of design. Um, I did not like the day to day of sort of like, you know, designing a building where you, every floor is the same and you're kind of looking at checking every beam and it's a giant building and it's, you know, some of that can be very tedious. Um, and I was really interested in kind of the bigger scale, like the implications of the community that the building was in and the environmental impacts of, of um, engineering. And so I ended up 
pivoting, um, you know, even while I was still working in engineering, um, getting very interested in sort of sustainable uh, building design. And at the time, there was this big movement of green buildings. And so I got LEED certified, which is a certification called Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And I ended up getting into a program in um, the UK at the University of Cambridge called Engineering for Sustainable Development. And I got a master's degree um, in in that and got to spend you know a year in Cambridge on the other side of the pond in the UK, um, which was just an incredible experience. Um, but that just like totally broadened my vision of my career and what I could focus on. And um, it, it was an interesting degree because it's called a Master of Philosophy, which kind of, uh, it's a unique uh, thing that they have in the UK. Uh, but it, it was kind of more, I like to describe it as like engineering ethics um, and the study of, you know, what is the engineer's responsibility in the age of climate change, in the age of you know, just all of the issues that we have with, you know, so much population all over the world. Certainly we still need big infrastructure like roads and dams and bridges, um, you know, power power um, and communication systems and all these things. But, um, but the impacts are so huge. And we know that. We know the sort of negative impacts and um, unintended consequences of the things that we've designed. Um, and we're now trying to account for that. And so what is an engineer's obligation to understand those impacts and design in solutions. And, uh, you know, as I was sort of grappling with these big issues and thinking about like, oh my God, global climate change, there's so many problems. I, I got very interested in bicycling at the same time and urban transportation systems. And, um, and I thought like, man, gosh, I should have been an urban planner because I love, you know, these big complex kind of systems problems. But, you know, here at this point, I had now three engineering degrees. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? <laughs> What's the next step in my career? And I, um, you know, I had a, a professor when I was in England at the University of Cambridge who was an advisor. And I said, you know, I'm really struggling. I don't know what I want to do next in my career. I think maybe I want to do, you know, go work for a development nonprofit or something like just totally shift. And she was like, well, if you want to work for a nonprofit in any, you know, any sector, uh, any any kind of field, the most important thing you need to do is be able to fundraise and raise money. And she was like, so just pick something that you care about and find a way to raise money for them and you'll be an asset. I was like, okay. And I'm like literally on the plane coming home from England, like, you know, in, like journaling and thinking about what would I do? And I was like, well, I've always wanted to bike across the country. So maybe that's my thing. Like maybe that's what I'll I'll find somebody to raise money for and and do this organize this bike trip across the country. So that's what I did. Um, and this was in 2011. Um, so I planned this whole trip. I recruited my sister and my mom came and a really good friend of mine. So we were four women, you know, committed to this journey across the country. And I planned my route by picking the least bike friendly cities in the country. Like trying to connect them up. A lot of them are in the South, a bunch are in like Florida and Texas. And, um, and we were, we were planning to leave in February of 2012. So we also had to stay in the Southern part of the U S to avoid uh, winter weather. Um, but we planned this crazy route. We started in Key West, Florida, and we went, you know, all the way up Florida and then across and kind of hit like Arkansas, Alabama, Oklahoma down through Texas and then all the way across the the southern southwestern states um, and we finished in San Francisco wow. um, and it was just this amazing journey it took us three months we did 5200 miles our, I think our average was something like 70 miles a day um, we did take one day off a week anyway I could talk for the whole hour about <laughs> that trip alone yeah but literally it changed my life and um, I had the, you know, just totally serendipitous luck that at the end of the trip, we came to Sacramento. We were invited to speak at the State Department of Public Health was putting on a, a one day kind of conference about safe routes to school. And this was an organization, you know, I had learned about the Safe Routes National Partnership when I was doing my master's degree and was super interested in their mission. And they were one of the organizations that I ended up choosing to fundraise for on this trip, the Safe Routes Partnership, as well as the League of American Bicyclists. 
Um, and, and our cause was, you know, bike friendly cities, bike friendly communities. That's what we were, that's what we were talking about as we were biking across the country. And we went to lots of schools and we, you know, just connected with so many amazing groups across the country. So, so as I get to the end of this trip, we come to Sacramento and we met uh, Deb Hubsmith, who is an amazing, just amazing pioneer um, individual. She's unfortunately passed away a few years ago. She just has an incredible story. In fact, there's just a book out, out about Deb um, and her life, uh, which I recommend to anyone. But she basically on the spot was like, I want you to come work for me in Sacramento. What are you doing after this trip? Like, you, you know, you did this amazing, amazing thing and raised money for my organization and, and you should be an advocacy. And, and I just, you know, couldn't have been a luckier, you know, I, I couldn't have scripted it in terms of like finding a way into a job that I just was so passionate about. So that is what brought me to Sacramento. That's what got me into transportation. That's what got me into doing policy work. Um, and I, I learned, I got to study from Deb, who was just a total pro. She coached me and mentored me in my first year um, in Sacramento. And, and then, yeah, I can talk more about the work that I've done since, but, uh, but that's really what, um, what brought me here and what got me into being an advocate for um, sustainable transportation. I love that story. I love that story. And I love, and I love too, that, you know, Deb played a huge part in that. Um, uh, yes, we, we lost her much, much too soon, um, in, in all of us. And, uh, uh, yeah, but her legacy continues to live on, um, as you well know, uh, in the, the Safe Routes uh, National Partnership and the great work that is going on there. Uh, and I believe that, uh, as part of this too, you also then did some work with CalBike. Talk, talk yes. a little bit about that work and what CalBike is. So CalBike is the, the California Bicycle Coalition. They're the statewide bike advocacy group here in California. They are networked with um, all the local bike coalitions in different cities and counties across the state. We're a huge state, so there's a lot of advocacy work to be done here. Um, Cal Bike is really the representative uh, for issues about related to bicycling in Sacramento. So after coming moving to Sacramento, I worked for Safe Routes for a couple of years, and then I transitioned over to Cal Bike, and I was a policy director there for several years. And I just absolutely loved working at Cal Bike. Um, a, a good friend of mine is now the executive director, um, and so I'm working with them again, really closely in my new capacity. But CalBike has been instrumental in, uh, you know, so many things. I think maybe what's most most significant in my mind is the work around creating the active transportation program in the state of California, which is the the main grant government grant program, both federal and state funded, um, that funds active transportation infrastructure in the state. So both biking and walking, but it is you know, more than 200 million a year now. Um, it got a big boost a couple of years ago. So they're just massive investments being made all over the state through the active transportation program. And CalBike was instrumental in creating that program and also in making sure that that program prioritizes investments in disadvantaged communities in our state. Because we have, you know, so many communities that have been underserved and been left behind and making sure that there's safe places to walk and bike. And this program is trying to address that by by making sure disadvantaged communities get uh, projects funded first. Fantastic. Now, it, it sounds like this ATP, the Active Transportation uh, Program funding is a funding entity. It's getting, is it actually getting money directly from the feds and then being able to help distribute that? Yes. Wow. Yeah, it's run. Yeah. It's run by the State Department of Transportation, Caltrans, as we call it here in California, and it's both state and federal money. So there's there's a combination of kind of federal formula funds as well as some state gas tax funds that you know get combined into this pot that we call the Active Transportation Program. And then every two years, our Transportation Commission awards you know grants the money to local governments, um, cities and counties to do projects in their community. Yeah, fantastic. I know I just had the opportunity in November uh, to film and profile uh, some wonderful projects that went in in, San, in Santa Barbara uh, in some nice. of their uh, uh, 
kind of at risk neighborhoods, neighborhoods that have been, you know, historically underinvested in. And so um, wonderful, safe pedestrian crossings going in, some protected bike lanes going in, uh, wonderful traffic calming and modal filters going in in that neighborhood. And that word just kept coming up over and over and over again, the a- active transportation uh, program and, the, and fund. So that's fantastic. Now, you mentioned, yeah, you're going to be working with uh, CalBike once again in your new role, which is over here at Fearless advocacy. Talk a little bit about (laughs) Fearless. Um, I'm so proud to have recently joined uh, this firm, Fearless Advocacy, which was founded 10 years ago by my friend Jennifer Fearing. So Fearless is is obviously a play Uh, on her name. What a great name. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's an incredible brand and and one that I definitely embrace in my work. So, um, So it's a really good fit for me. Uh, but Jennifer also is someone who I have admired. She's a, a lobbyist in Sacramento, represents primarily nonprofit organizations. So she only works for people who have values uh, that are aligned with hers. Um, and that's part of you know where the fearless brand comes from is kind of fighting for those causes that she cares about so much and and that you know frankly really need advocates need need folks who are working um, who who really know the work and uh, know how to do it well and and can bring some extra umph to um, to those causes so. You can see, yeah, lots of, you know, Cal, Cal Nonprofits, which is a, an association of nonprofits, represents hundreds of nonprofits, um, lots of uh, wildlife organizations, um, ocean protection organizations. Um, and then you'll see California Bicycle Coalition is in there, Transform is in there, a few of clients that I've been able to, to bring to the table um, to start to build out a transportation portfolio. So my job is going to be director, or it is, director of transportation advocacy. Um, And so I'm going to help us kind of grow our work um, advocating for uh, nonprofits around transportation. I love it. That is so cool. And and what's really, really interesting, too, about your, your history and getting that um, that degree, the doctor of philosophy degree um, from Cambridge and the point that you made of like the ethics of from an engineering perspective, because this is a a very common thread in terms of our current state of affairs. When we look at the sense of urgency that we should have to be moving forward with uh, infrastructure projects that, you know, are morally justifiable, (laughs) you know, and ethical. And, uh, and I talk a lot on the, the channel here about, uh, you know, what is the code of ethics that engineering should have, especially when we look at transportation engineering? And you mentioned a couple of different things, including, you know, underserved populations. And uh, it, it's just it, it's amazing um, that application, because it goes from like the hard sciences. And that was kind of my background. It was in hard sciences in human physiology. And, uh, and then very quickly I started getting into, uh, you know, past human physiology into psychology and behavior change. And like, for, and, and similarly with you, hard sciences of how to build buildings and infrastructure in engineering. And then all of a sudden you have this layer of, of philosophy and ethics and a fair amount of behavior changes filtered in there as well. (laughs) Uh, It's interesting how, how, how that works. You know, it's like, you can't, you've got the hard sciences, but you also have to have quote unquote, the soft sciences of ethics and, and, and philosophy and all that. Yeah. I think it's, it's such an important point. So when I, you know, I did my finished my undergraduate degree 20 years ago when I studied engineering as an undergrad, you know, I had an ethics course, we touched on it, um, but it was, you know, it was mostly focused on, you know, if you make a mistake, how do you write that wrong? And how do you be really honest about doing good work and owning owning mistakes and, you know, making sure you correct those mistakes before they become, you know, things that create harm? It did it, it was not at all focused on the sort of bigger community and, you know, even global impacts of our projects. And, you know, when you're an engineer, the first thing you do when you're starting out looking at a problem is you put boundaries around the problem. You say, this is the system that I'm working in. And usually it's like, 
just a little bit outside of your bridge or your roadway or whichever little piece of infrastructure you're building. You're not thinking about all the homes and the land uses and the bigger system that your project is connected into, you know, for transportation, like one little link in the system, one little, you know, what we would call a project as an engineer is part of a connected network that gets you from A to B that might have miles and miles of roadway or trail or, you know, whatever on either end. Um, And all of those pieces, the whole system matters. It's not just the one project. But in engineering, we tend to focus on just this little piece and we try to bound the problem. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, we we created a huge amount of negative impacts, especially when you think about, you know, our highway system. Right. And and I and I think only in, you know, at least as far as I'm aware, I think only in really recent years have we you know really started to like broadly mainstream and talk about the impacts of um, highways on communities that were divided, destroyed, you know, displaced, um, and start to really atone for that. You see some programs that were created in like the bipartisan infrastructure law and very recently in California about converting highways back to boulevards or taking down highways and transportation infrastructure that divided and displaced communities. We have a bunch of examples right here in Sacramento. When I-5 was built, it it completely displaced the, the Japantown community that was a thriving economic center, lots of small businesses, lots of homes, and there's massive impact. And the legacy of that is, you know, we're still living with today. And in fact, we're still doing it today. We're still widening highways and continuing to displace homes, continuing to, you know, bulldoze parts of communities that have been you know, living with this legacy for generations. Um, and it's it's got to be in the forefront of our conversation is those those kinds of impacts. And unfortunately, you know, we've sort of, we've not sort of, we have put the burden of thinking about that stuff on planners and not on engineers. Engineers have still are able to come in, you know, after, <laughs> after we've already thought about like, where are we going to widen the highway? And they just figure out how to do it. You know, they just run the calculations of like, well, how big do the curves need to be and how much pavement do we need? And, you know, they're not thinking about the community. They're not thinking about the environment and the emissions and the noise and all of those other things. There's sort of already an assumption that this project is important and it's needed. Um, and we don't think about those bigger impacts. So, I mean, back, back to your question, I'm kind of going on a big tangent, but I think it is so important that that be part of our engineering education. We cannot have engineers that are not thinking about, are not aware of the bigger, wider impact of um, of what we're building and what we're designing. Yeah. And to be fair to engineers, I mean, uh, that to your point, that hasn't been a part of their training and, and what- 100%. Yeah, maybe that should be part of their their training. Uh, And so to be fair to them, it then requires that we change the system. And your 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 closing comment here on this tweet is it's hard to change direction when there's so much momentum in the system, the system of just continually building more roads and more lane miles for highways. Um, And so it kind of isn't I mean, it's easy to to pick on. The engineers. I mean, there's there's lots that we can pick on the engineers about because, well, there's a lot that we should pick on the engineers for, as you well know. <laughs> as as an engineer, yeah, I, I will, yeah, embrace that. Yeah, Chuck Marone and I uh, joke about that too because he's also an engineer, but then also did a planning degree. But yes, we've got a system, and in that particular article on I-15. Uh, you, 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 there's, you're quoted in there too. And, and, and this is the quote that you have uh, in that system. It's like, if you create more space on the freeway, more people are going to drive and increase vehicle miles traveled. And it's, it's, it's one of the, the most important things for, for us to realize as a society is if we keep making it easier for people to drive, they will drive. And, Ultimately, we don't get much bang for the buck because then more people drive and then those lane miles get filled up. So, right. 
your point here is that it's totally appropriate for the CTC, and that's the the, the Transportation Commission, uh, to be asking questions like, did you do the analysis well? Are you mitigating the impact well? Yeah, if, you know, before they start handing out the funding to build yet even more and more miles. And so I think those are like the questions from an ethical perspective that we should be asking. You know, is this what we should be doing 100%. if what we say we value is human life and uh, uh, <laughs> trying to do something about a climate that's literally burning up? Right. Yeah, 100 percent. And I, you know, I am an engineer. I also, you know, I worked at, at Caltrans in our state DOT for six years. I, I was very devoted to um, that organization, that agency. And, you know, a lot of folks will make big generalizations about, you know, this big bad organization that's doing all this damage or, you know, doing projects that are not are, are causing harm. But the reality is, there are incredibly good people at Caltrans. And I'm glad, you know, that's, I'm glad. What, that's what kept me there for so long is like all of the people, I mean, I care so much and planners, engineers, you know, biologists, the, the admin folks, all the support people, the maintenance workers, the folks that are out, you know, in the field every day on our roadways, you know, keeping, keeping the roadways working and keeping them plowed in the winter. I mean, just really good people who are doing the good work in public service. And, um, you know, the engineers are, like you said, like we're talking about, they're trained to do a particular job and they actually do it incredibly well. <laughs> if we tell them their job is to like build these projects and get them done quickly and, you know, focus on on time, on budget, they're going to do it. And they do it incredibly well at Caltrans. It's, I just can't say enough about you know, the, it's a, it's an incredible organization, but there's so much momentum in that system, 22,000 people at Caltrans and their job primarily what they have been, what they have been charged with is building and maintaining our state highway system, our primarily car infrastructure. There's other little pieces, other little units that work on rail, that work on active transportation, that do landscape design, you know, that do all these other things that are related, but they're small units in a 22,000 person organization. And so, you know, you create a system like that, it's gonna deliver on what you've been charged. And it's very hard to change that despite our policies and our interests and our, you know, state goals shifting, um, it's really hard to, to shift. And so, you know, the, the result is what we would expect. They're gonna keep doing things the way they've always done them. And, um, and it takes, well, ho hopefully you know, they more than ho one hopefully person. They won't. <laughs> hopefully they won't keep doing things the way they have been. Hopefully it will start to change, but you're speaking from experience. I mean, you did work within Caltrans, you did work within the organization and, and yeah, I mean, the whole reason why we're talking here today is because this dust up all took place, you know, last fall of, you know, you ended up losing your job at Caltrans for speaking out against a highway widening because you were kind of speaking truth to power and you were saying, you know, questioning, hey, are we really doing due diligence to the to what we're saying we're, we should be doing? We don't have to get into the specifics if you don't want to of, of the, the nitty gritty of of the the new do the nuance and the minutia of it. People can read about that. But. I do want to point out that to your point, yes, there's some incredible people that work within these state DOTs, including Caltrans, but oftentimes they're just trapped in a system where that momentum, as we talked about before, the road building, lane building, highway widening momentum, because that's what we've been doing for the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years it's hard to change. It's hard to steer that ship, but darned if you didn't try. <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. And I, I think, I, I mean, I've, I've made this point a bunch of times in talking about it since then. And I'm, I am happy to talk about, you know, the, this, the circumstances around um, my, my termination at Caltrans, but um, you know, my job, I was hired to be a change agent. I was hired six years ago at Caltrans um, in the sustainability program, which was, you know, kind of brand new at the time. It was just getting going. I worked for the woman who was the deputy for sustainability at the time. 
And she brought me on to help build the program and help really, you know, spread the gospel and and help, you know, improve guidance and improve policy at Caltrans to be more in line with our sustainability objectives in California. And we have very strong, you know, laws around climate change, around equity. And and so that's, you know, that's why I was hired at Caltrans was really to come in and be a voice for change. And I was successful enough at it that I was promoted into this job that was the one, you know, that I was in when I was terminated, where I was a deputy director. I mean, I was like, fifth in line below the director of the whole department. And I was in a powerful position. So it wasn't just speaking truth to power. I was in a a position of power. And the things that I was raising, like the questions that I was raising, the concerns that I was raising about the particular project that, you know, was, was the subject of my whistleblowing, you know, those were the conversations and the questions I would raise every single day in the job. There was nothing different from my perspective that I did um, related to that project that I wouldn't have done about any other project. That was my job. I was a change agent. You know, I was very practiced in saying, like, are these the right things? Is this the right project? Is, you know, did we do everything that we could on this project to mitigate the environmental impacts of widening this freeway? Did we look at transit options in the area? Did we look at, you know, the walking and bicycling connections between Sacramento and Davis? And did we find ways to improve those as much as we can? Because that's how, you know, it's not just about demonizing and saying highway widening isn't a good thing, because highway widening is going to create more space for more people to drive. It does, in theory, improve transportation, if that's what you care about, creating more space for more people to drive. But it doesn't improve congestion over the long term if congestion is the problem you're trying to solve. And it certainly doesn't give people other options. In fact, for the most part, widening the freeway makes it harder to get across the freeway. It makes it harder to walk and bike in the air. It makes it a lot less pleasant because you have all the extra noise from the traffic. And it doesn't do a lot to make taking transit better, unless you specifically prioritize transit, unless that new lane that you're building is a is a bus only lane that's going to give priority to buses and buses are not going to be stuck in traffic. So that is really the problem, right? Is the more we spend our limited funding, limited government dollars, tax dollars on widening, which is an incredibly expensive way to try to improve transportation, the less we have for other things. And in fact, the worse we make circumstances for other options potentially. So that's what we should be weighing. And there, you know, it becomes this sort of like black and white debate of like, or do you hate highways or, or not? And it's just not that simple. It's more a question of how do we prioritize how we're making investments to have the biggest overall benefits. And I think, you know, more and more we know, and we acknowledge that providing people with options not to drive is better. It's better for communities, it's better for travel, certainly better for the environment. Um, But it does, again, it takes a long time to change the system, to change people's behaviors, to help people see that there are superior options that, you know, not don't involve them getting in their car. Changing habits is kind of a generational effort. Um, So yes, Caltrans, I think is is making a shift, but it's a generational kind of shift. It's not going to happen next year, or even in five years, it's going to take a long time, it's going to take a lot of people advocates like myself pushing to get there. When I saw this happening, and, and and granted, I mean, you're in a much better shape with your DOT than we are here necessarily in, in Texas. <laughs> you know, and many states have uh, DOTs that are almost even outright hostile to, to anything other than building highway miles. Um, in in your situation there, it, it kind of is like, you know, hey, I'm going to be this change agent. That's the role I'm playing. And part of the reason why I'm here is because we have this, these imperatives, these desires to do something about the climate situation that we have about global warming. And California in particular is just getting pounded by, you know, the changes in the climate and, you know, that imperative. So the political structure, you know, all the way to the top is such that, hey, we need to do something about this. But when it actually gets to the minutia of, okay, well, how do we make this cultural shift? And then how do we, you know, either put the brakes on or steer this tanker, 
pardon the the terrible pun here <laughs> of you know of of changing the momentum in a system that as we said earlier is just all about you know continually building capacity for more driving and and I remember when the 405 was widened uh, you know, it, it was just a Fair couple of years before, it, <laughs> you know, it was completely, you know, clogged again. In fact, it, right. we were hoping that, oh yeah, well, if we widen this darn thing, you know, we'll get, uh, you know, maybe five years relief, maybe 10 years relief. No, it was like what, 18, 24 months or something like that. And we were back at gridlock. So yeah, I, I hope I'm hopeful that, that this will, 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 you know, I, I don't want to say you were a sacrifice and you become a <laughs> martyr. Your career was a martyr in that because you landed in the perfect type of role, which is to really focus on on this part of it is we need to continue the pressure on the policies that need to take place in this transportation realm to get significant change. Um, Grant Ennis and I, uh, Grant is the author of the, the book Dark PR. I don't know if you've had a chance to read this uh, this book or not, but you, you might want to watch my my episode with him. <laughs> but he speaks to that. But the entire book is is like talking about it's imperative that we address the fact that so much of these challenges when it comes to uh, changing our transportation systems is the fact that so much of it is subsidized to this level and subsidized by motordom, as Peter Norton would say, um, to continue doing things in the status quo, continue doing things in, in this nature. In this right. Manner. Well, and it's an incredibly hard system to change, too. I would just I mean, I, California is is. You know, we have kind of a unique complexity of <laughs> of government, you know, at all levels, because we've got local government, we've got regional government, you know, and the, the decisions that get made about transportation are made at all levels. So it's a, it's a very complex system to interact with because you have to kind of be paying attention to, you know, everybody, all of these different levels of government and who controls the funding and who's, you know, most behind any project. And it, it really it's different. It's different every time. Sometimes the local government is putting money in first to get a project started. And then they're expecting that the state and the feds are going to, you know, invest as the project moves forward. So you get lots of different money on a project and then it's off and rolling. It's like, you know, you can't stop it once once it's once the momentum is there and you get lots of elected officials who have championed getting funding and then they're all bought in and they want to see the results. And so, you know, often it's decades from the time where a project gets its first money, it's, you know, kind of doing its conceptual planning and its environmental studies. And then, you know, until it actually gets built, take de- it takes decades. And, and sometimes, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, like the 405 example. Um, so you can see why it's such a hard system to change because there's just like this crazy complexity of distributed decision making and, uh, you know, different complex funding and, um, you can't just like push uh, on one lever and change the system. You have to change it all over the place. But I do, you know, I feel very hopeful. And I think, um, you know, certainly my my position at Caltrans, you know, being in that role was a, a victim of um, kind of ra- raising a protest flag. But, um, but I, you know, I, there's so much work to do in advocacy and I'm very happy to be back kind of on this side of things with the experience and the expertise that I gained at Caltrans, because I really understand how decisions get made and how that system works. And so I can be a real asset to the advocates that I work with now um, in providing that understanding and making sure that we're thinking about shaping policy in a way that will really be effective when it gets put in place. And, you know, I'm incredibly thankful for the media and, you know, how many outlets reach out to me and said, hey, this is a really interesting story. This is something that people care about. This affects everyone's daily lives. Nobody is not affected by transportation and, and highways. Everybody in California in some way interacts with the transportation system every day. And 
And so it's a compelling, interesting story. And so there's been a lot of coverage, including now, you know, they're starting LA Times, Politico, they're starting to pay attention to what happens at the Transportation Commission, which has been, you know, they're an oversight. They have a huge responsibility in California. Um, They approve the billions of dollars of funding that go to Caltrans and to a lot of local agencies around the state. So their job is really important. And now some of those media outlets are paying attention to the commission and their meetings. So Um, bringing some sunlight to the process and having some interesting and compelling coverage of these issues that helps the public better understand what's happening. Transportation is not common sense, right? These systems don't like work how you would imagine. You know, you're sitting in traffic on a highway and you imagine like, of course we need an extra lane here because there's so much demand, but like people don't understand the level of complexity of like real solutions to that transportation problem. Congestion is not a problem that you solve just by creating more space for more cars. It's that's not how you how you address congestion. It's much more complicated. So um, so you need, you know, you need to help people understand like the the complexity of the solutions and help create that demand for thinking smarter about the problems that we're trying to address. Yeah. Giving people options. Yeah. And a big part of, you know, giving people more options is, you know, what we, like we were talking about earlier is building out those alternative uh, networks and those alternative systems. And so going back to the ATP, you know, are you getting down um, on all ages and abilities network? Are you building that network out so that people legitimately have uh, the ability to, to be able to get to meaningful destinations, especially when we consider that, anywhere between 40 and 50% of every trip, or, you know, when we look at all of our trips, 40, 50% of them are essentially, you know, bikeable distances. And so can we create an environment that encourages, you know, those choices? Maybe not every trip is taken by bike. Um, You know, maybe it's a combination of, you know, jump on transit and then bike. And then, once you build the infrastructure in there, you can start working on some of the other things like working on the soft side and, and encouraging <laughs> people to get out and ride. I had to ask you about this photo. So I, a, I, my, my partner, Laura and I, we both have that same torch uh, helmet oh, uh, nice. that lights up. So those are, those are fun. Um, I love them. What's the story behind this awesome shot? Oh, man. Well, those are two, those ladies in the front there, two of my colleagues from Caltrans. So, you know, very good examples of other change agents at Caltrans that are doing really meaningful work. Um, I'm trying to remember, this is in Sacramento, but I don't, um, I don't remember exactly which ride this is. Yeah, it looks um, but, like an awesome group ride. <laughs> yeah, I think it maybe was a May as Bike Month um, event. We always tried to do, you know, organize lots of events during May um, at Caltrans. It really were geared towards, you know, getting our getting some of the the leaders at Caltrans and and other staff uh, out to to ride and to you know engage in active transportation. Because again, I think that's part also of changing the culture and changing the mindset of folks making decisions and and doing the engineering is you know, having to go out and actually interact with what they've designed um, and understand, you know, how does like the striped bike lane sure doesn't feel that comfortable <laughs> when traffic's whizzing by or when we're, you know, passing a freeway on on ramp, like it would be way better to be on a separated path or, you know, out of traffic, protected from traffic. So, um, so we did a lot of those kinds of events um, and they were well, well loved and lots of people showed up for them. So, um, there, that culture, I think, is is changing a lot, and um, is just really exciting um, to to see the potential. Well, you just referenced a, a couple of your your formal co- former colleagues there at Caltrans, and uh, you are also the recipient of the Rosa Parks. Uh, Diversity Leadership Award of the uh, Sacramento chapter of WTS. I I think one of the things that I've been noticing, especially when we look at um, the cities where we're seeing just some amazing things happening, one of the common denominators that I see, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, Mayor Anne Hildago in Paris, uh, you know, some of the other strong mayors that I'm seeing on the East Coast, you know, looking at you, Boston, uh, (laughs) and others is, you know, advancing women in leadership roles like in elected uh, positions, but also this, advancing women in transportation. Talk a little bit about the WTS organization. 
Sure. Um, well, I uh, was, yeah, I was really honored to be awarded um, the the Rosa Parks Diversity Award from our Sacramento chapter. I was involved in WTS, I think, when I was an uh, undergrad, um, getting my first engineering degree. So I, I've known the organization a long time, you know, certainly providing support scholarships, resources, you know, a network to women in a historically male dominated field is, is critical. Um, so I think, you know, WTS is a terrific resource. And, and, and I've also, you know, I think just personally had made it a, a mission of mine to mentor women, um, not, not just in engineering, but in any career field that I've been in, uh, because I do think it is so important to have women leaders in involved in making our decisions. And I've seen a real shift in my time in engineering, also in transportation, with more and more women stepping into the field, coming, you know, coming in as, as you know, new engineers and planners, but, uh, but also stepping into leadership roles. And I think that reflects this shift in our goals and our priorities and how we think about, you know, the taking care of our communities and how our communities are impacted by the things that we design. Women often bring, you know, and, and I don't want to stereotype here, obviously there's, you know, lots of folks that do this, but, you know, they bring real care to their work. They care about, you know, the impacts and the people. And, um, and I think that shift in the field and the sector and the focus of, you know, what we're, you know, what, what outcomes we're trying to get from our projects is um, is in in part because of more and more women entering the field. Um, so I think it's incredibly important, and um, yeah, organizations like WTS really help to to do that and help to make the shift. Yeah, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree, and uh, <laughs> I I, lo- I really embrace that, and I love seeing uh, more and more uh, women in these critical roles. Uh, I think because of um, you know, probably a lot of traditional caregiving uh, roles that women have had, they bring a level that brings us a little bit closer to what we were talking about before, where it's not just like the hard sciences, it's also an appreciation for that softer side, you know, of being empathetic for uh, what's being done and maybe even pausing and saying, is this even the right thing to be doing? And that brings us right back around to the ethics side of things and the uh, philosophy side of things. Uh, So I think that's really important. So in looking at your new role and um, what the types of things that you're working on, um, what are you super excited about, uh, you know, pushing forward and and, and moving into, you know, the rest of the year here in 2024? Ooh, just this year. Um, well, I'm super excited. Oh, and beyond and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause especially things that you're, you're working on, which are, can be policy related, could be, I don't know, maybe even making sure that you're, we're putting, you know, candidates, you know, into elected officials that, you know, mm-hmm. are reflecting, you know, these morals and these ethics that we're, we're, you know, trying to push forward here. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an important year for that, for sure. Um, knowing, you know, what, what candidates are thinking about as they're running for office this year that, uh, yeah, relate to these issues and, uh, you know, not just transportation, but also housing. Housing is incredibly um, high priority in California because we have, you know, just this rising crisis. So. Yeah. When you look at housing, you look at affordability, you cannot not also talk about transportation in that same breath exactly. of uh, affordable yeah. housing, because exactly. when you really look at the realities of, of household uh, budgets and you look at affordable housing, transportation is a huge percentage of what is affordable part. So it's it, it, not to mention just distances too. I mean, you know, getting back to, are there meaningful destinations within there? So you get into land use planning and everything else. Yeah, yep, exactly. No, you're totally right. So th- those are the kinds of things that I look for. A lot of elected officials, when they get asked questions about transportation or climate change and transportation, you know, they kind of immediately go to like, well, we need to electrify. We need to have more electric vehicles and more infrastructure to support that. And I totally agree that is needed. That's critical because we are going to continue to drive for the foreseeable future. But we also need the infrastructure and to make those changes and to invest in public transit, to invest in making our streets walkable and bikeable. And 
infill, you know, the kind of infrastructure that supports infill housing development so that we're reinvesting in our existing communities rather than building new ones on the edge of our cities, on the edge of our metro areas. So I look out for those kinds of comments um, and and kind of candidate platforms when they when they put out their um, their platforms. So um, so that's really important. That is something, you know, obviously it's going to be big this year for a lot of folks. You know, there's also a lot of work to, I, I mean, I'm working on several bills for clients in the California legislature this okay. year on behalf that was of gonna be, Cal That Mike was actually going to be my question is given your yeah. kind of role, I mean, is a lot of this, you know, looking at kind of formulating, you know, some mm-hmm. of those bills and I guess that is answering it is that's the level that you are looking at from a policy and a legislative perspective is that's helping right. uh, in that area. Okay. Yeah. And, and so there are a couple of specific bills. I'm happy to talk about them, but I'm also helping to support a whole coalition of advocates that are working in Sacramento um, that are part of a, a network called Climate Plan. Um, and they work together on, you know, supporting bills, developing bill ideas together, but also thinking about like, what is the longer term priority for our collective groups. Um, and so I'm, I'm helping that group as well. Think about, you know, how are we not just running bills, but also working on kind of the administrative side of policy change, thinking about the PR side and the, you know, the public mindset and public engagement change that we need to be making. So that's really exciting. And to me, I think what I'm hopeful about is, the collective work and how that is growing, not just in California, but we see, you know, nationally, there is a a network now called the Freeway Fighters, which is, you know, bringing groups together, local groups all over the country that are trying to fight against freeway widening projects. (laughs) And I I just think, you know, it's it's incredibly inspiring that these groups are getting organized at that level and that there's infrastructure and resources and support um, to, to, you know, share best practices and share success and, and help, um, you know, this larger movement so that it can be a collective and not just, you know, sort of one-off battles that, you know, groups don't, may not have the resources to fight against their state DOT. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing I hope to be really involved in, in the future, um, is, is supporting the, you know, networks and coalitions and, you know, bringing, bringing my experience and, um, my expertise to support some of that bigger strategy. Yeah. 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 I, I see, I say that in jest about the, uh, the freeway <laughs> fighters, um, uh, of course here in, in Austin, Texas, um, that, that's oh, a, yes. a, a big part of our, our challenge here. You're and, an epicenter uh, right now. Yeah, for we're, sure. we're an epicenter. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're actually recording this on, on February 22nd and, uh, earlier this week, I actually released, uh, you know, this, this video here, the second one down on the screen, um, which is the wider won't work. And and the fact that rethink 35, a community organization is suing a text dot, um, you know, for similar types of things, they, it, it looks like TxDOT, um, you know, was playing a little bit fast and loose in terms of, uh, avoiding, uh, you know, some of the impacts, you know, on their environmental assessment. And so, uh, the community is calling them out on that. And, and this organization, which is a community run organization is, uh, filing a civil lawsuit as well, a civil complaint, as well as a, a, a lawsuit saying that they didn't actually follow the process that the feds say that you need to follow. Amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So you're, you're, I, I, to your point is that, yes, this is not just isolated to California. I mean, this really is part of a broader movement. Um, to close this out, any final thoughts on anything that we haven't yet talked about that you want to leave the audience with? Um, final thoughts. I, I, I think anytime I'm asked um, this sort of a question, I mean, I, I like to tell people that like, there's never been a more exciting time to work in transportation. <laughs> and so I really encourage people, especially young people, you know, if they're interested in these issues, if, you know, not even just transportation, but land use planning, um, you know, just our, our systems, the systems that our communities are built on. It's just, there's so much change and there's so much opportunity. The problems are really thorny, 
But I think that makes it so interesting and and fun. And you have to be strategic and you have to be creative and uh, you have to be willing to speak up and challenge the process. Um, so I, I love, you know, nonprofit advocacy organizations tend to be breeding grounds for people who are young and outspoken and passionate. And, and I, I just love working with young advocates who are, you know, learning the process and finding their way because they're just so creative and energetic. And, um, and that's what we need. Uh, frankly, that's what we need in government, too. It's, it's a good thing when advocates, you know, spend a few years uh, working for a nonprofit and then go into government because we need those kinds of outspoken folks to be inside government, too, and be advocates, as I like to say. Um, so, so yeah, I just think it's so exciting and, um, and I, you know, appreciate the chance to talk about it and kind of share my story because I think I've, I've taken an unconventional path through my career, but I, I love what I do and I'm really excited to be, um, continuing to, to work on this mission of improving our transportation system. So. And we appreciate all you, are, John, for the time. Oh, oh, you you are quite welcome. We're quite lucky to have <laughs> you uh, and that varied background that you have, because it, I think it is essential that you had that engineering background yeah. and came to this. I mean, it's one of the, the biggest sure. challenges. I mean, my background is in public health. And so that's what I bring to this argument. Mm-hmm. And this, this conversation is, you know, 20 some odd years in, in the public health arena, you know, before, you know, 15 years or so, it's, you know, focusing on the built environment and, and going into this. But this photo right here I think is is illustrates exactly what you were saying is that it's exciting it's fun and uh, there's a lot of energy and a lot of great momentum happening and yes it is going to be hard to to butt up against and you know fight against the status quo of motordom but we can do it and we have to do it there is a sense of urgency that we need to do this and I certainly do appreciate everything that you have done and are continuing to do uh Jeannie Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Jeannie Ward-Waller. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and remember to ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content I'm producing here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts uh, via Patreon, buy me a coffee, YouTube, super thanks right down there, <laughs> as well as buying things from the Active Town store like my streets are for people swag that I've got out there, uh, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit. Uh, every little bit helps and is very much appreciated. Uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.